On this episode of Most Notorious, one of the worst mining disasters in American history, in Cherry, Illinois. 480 men and boys dropped down into that mine that Saturday morning, and 259 of them died in the disaster. Hello all and welcome to another episode of Most Notorious. Eric Riven is here. Appreciate you listening, as always. I'm extremely pleased to have Karen Tintori with me today. She is an internationally best-selling author of fiction and nonfiction. Her work has been translated into more than 25 languages. Many of her books have been written with co-author and good friend Jill Gregory. Unto the Daughters, the legacy of an honor killing in an Italian-American family is one of her nonfiction solo books, which I would definitely love to cover on a future episode of the show. And the nonfiction solo book she is here to talk about today is called Trapped, the 1909 Cherry Mine Disaster. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Eric, for having me. I I always love to talk about this little known story. So this book is very personal to you, isn't it? You have a family connection to the story. The book is personal. Uh, My grandfather, Tintori, died before I was born. And my mom thought she was pregnant with me. She hadn't killed the rabbit yet back back in those days. Uh, Pregnant woman urinated, and the, and if the urine killed a rabbit, I, I don't now I now I think it was true, but now I'm wondering if it was fiction. But anyway, uh, he said I won't live to see the baby, and he died the next day. But we lived downstairs, and his widow, my grandma, lived upstairs, and I can picture her standing on the stairs, saying, "Your grandfather survived the Cherry Mine disaster," and it was like your grandfather walked on water. And, you know, when you're a kid, even when you're a teenager, you don't think to ask these things. And it was only when I started doing genealogical research uh, some 20, 25 years ago that I decided to look for information about the Cherry Mine disaster and about my grandfather, because he was the ancestor I knew the least about. And... um, I wrote to the mayor of Cherry, Illinois. I wrote to the United Mine Workers. And I started collecting the pieces to the puzzle completely out of order and met some people. Uh, There was a gentleman named Ed Caldwell in Princeton who was fascinated with the disaster and collected material and did research. Uh, And Jack Rooney, whose grandfather, Marchetti, actually survived the disaster. And he grew up in Cherry. His mother was an Italian immigrant. His father was an Irish immigrant. And he's Mr. Cherry Mine Disaster because from the time he was a little boy asking questions of um, the few survivors who were left and their families, he has been obsessed with this story for so long. And in fact, I thought that Jack was going to write the book and I kept waiting and waiting and he wasn't. And I was actually sitting in the movie theater watching Titanic when I said to myself, you're sitting on Titanic in a coal mine. Ask Jack if he's going to do it or if you've got the green light. And Jack said, go ahead. And he was extremely and has been extremely helpful in in promoting and doing everything possible to get this story out there. Surprisingly, even in Illinois, Cherry is a hundred miles away from Chicago. It is the northernmost coal field in Illinois, but the Cherry Mine disaster is not even taught in the schools in Illinois. It, to me, it's very surprising that v- very few people, I just ran into someone, a Facebook writer friend who lives in Naperville, not you know two hours away from Cherry, never heard of the disaster. So thank you, thank you for helping us bring more of this historically and 
emotionally um, important story to, to more readers and more listeners. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it definitely deserves to be taught in Illinois schools. So can you tell us a bit about the construction of the mine, how it was built? I know you write in your book that it was considered at the time to be the safest mine in the state and possibly the country. Yes. Uh, What happened was the St. Paul Mining Company had sent some, uh, there, there was really thought to be no coal in that northern part of Illinois. And they had sent some engineers out to take a look, and they struck the most amazing vein, two veins of of, uh, coal there, totally unexpected. And coal usually is in the ground in three different veins. The first vein is very narrow. It can't be mined. The second vein at Cherry was 350 feet below ground, and the third vein was 500 feet below ground. They discovered enough coal to keep workers, uh, usually at that time it was seasonal. You only worked half the year mining coal. But there was enough coal there that they figured that they could mine year-round for more than 50 years and never run out of coal. And in 1909, when this disaster happened, uh, 62% of all energy in the United States was fueled by coal. Well, the mine company wanted this coal to run its railroad, to run its steam engines for the railroad, and to run its other mines and its office buildings. And so the word went out uh, to other mine, mine, there was mining going on in Springfield and some other areas of Illinois, to American miners. But the word of this great opportunity made its way to Europe. And my family came, my minor family came from Fanano, which is near Bologna. It's in the, it's in Modena. So many of the men and boys killed in this disaster happened to be Italian immigrants, but there were Greeks, Lithuanians, Poles, Slavs, I mean, French. What I say in the book is they traded daylight for a future because they went down into the mine, uh, in the morning when it was still dark and they came out when it was still dark and they worked in complete total darkness. I've been in a mine since I wrote the book. I, I was in a, a, a mine in Virginia where you, you go in through the side, you don't drop down into the mine, but you can't see your hand in front of your face in there. It's that dark. And so poverty, there was so much poverty going on in Europe at the time that this was an opportunity And then for most of these people, a tragic opportunity. The mine, to try to give you a visual picture, they sunk two shafts down through the earth to get to the mine, to get to the veins. One of them uh, was the main shaft where there was an elevator that went down, dropped down to the second vein. And the other, that's as far as it went. And the other shaft went all the way through down to the bottom of the mine where there were 200 mules that were kept. The mules, any mule that ever got sick and was taken out of the mine went crazy when they tried to bring it back down into the mine. The 200 mules would pull the coal carts full to the elevator shaft on the second vein and and then bring them up to, to the surface to be tagged. Each miner had a tag when he signed in in the morning and he was paid by the, by the tons of coal or by the carts of coal that he dug that day. The other shaft was a, it was the air shaft. It was to allow air to get into the mine. And so the men who worked in the third vein dropped down to the second vein, walked across, and then there was a staircase, a wooden staircase that went down into the lower part of the mine. And with the fire that happened, it was, it was a disaster waiting to, be, waiting to happen that shouldn't have happened. This was the first mine in the United States completely outfitted with electricity. Uh, at that time, miners used kerosene torches. They were supposed, the law said you could only use natural or animal fat in torches that they hung near the rafters to light the way in, in the main passageways. 
Um, the miners wore helmets that had lights on them, as many people have probably seen in pictures of books with pictures of, of miners. And But this had electricity throughout. And the engineer who built the stipple declared it fireproof. So there's where you've got the Titanic. You know, this was a mine that was fireproof. Modern was supposed to be the pinnacle of mining and, and last for years and years. What happened was on a Saturday morning, most of the men worked a half a day on Saturday. So just after lunchtime, just before lunchtime, I'm sorry, there were several carts of coal that were ready to go up to the surface just as the hay to feed the mules was ready to come down. So because coal was king and they had to keep production going, the two young men, 15 and 20 year olds who were manning the hay cart, moved it to the side. Oh, what I forgot to tell you was that a week, three weeks before this disaster happened, the dampness in the lower level of the mine where the mules were caused a, a short in the electricity and the electricity went out. So the mine, the miners were reverted to using the kerosene torches to light the way. And so there were kerosene torches and they did, had not, they, they had put in an order for new electrical wiring, but it had not come in yet. I think those were the days where people weren't thinking about what supplies do we need to keep on hand and, you know, what contingencies should we be looking out for? So the kids moved the hay cart underneath one of the kerosene torches so that they could get the coal up. Well, you could, you could take a blowtorch to cut hay and it will not catch fire. The thought was that kerosene from that torch dripped into the hay and that accelerated a fire. So the kids tried to put it out with water. They couldn't put it out with water. And in a mine, because coal is right below shale and the shale causes cave-ins, the roofs of each level of the mine are timbered with big wooden timbers. And so the tragedy was that the flames started looking at the timbers and it went all the way across. And people, sometimes the fight, little fires happen in mines and the miners kept working. But the problem with Cherry was that you had all of these immigrants from different countries who had no common language. There were the mine bosses uh, were from English speaking countries, immigrants from English speaking countries. And when people started yelling, fire, fire, a lot of the immigrants had no idea what it meant. I mean, they couldn't even communicate with their next door neighbors except with nods or waves. So the fire actually got hold for a good 45 minutes before the real alarm, uh, the real call to abandon the mine took place. Well, when the townspeople saw smoke starting to come from the mine, you know, people started running to see what was going on. And there was a fan house nearby, and the fan was a, was a gigantic fan that would keep the airflow going through the mine to give the miners good air to breathe because there are pockets of, of uh, gas in mines that they call black damp. And so when they saw the, the smoke coming out, the engineer in charge of that, of that fan thought, well, you know, the guys are, they need, they need air. So let's reverse the fan and pump air into the mine. And that just fanned the flames. All it did was fuel the flames and the fire just kept going. The person who was supposed to call for the lad fire department to come never made the call, made the call. Eventually the um, Chicago fire department came and the fire, the Chicago Fire Department was pouring 60 to 100 gallons of water into the mine a minute. But if you think about it, it was the roof that was on fire, not the floor. And so it did nothing except create a sauna in that mine. And the, the people who were trapped on the lower levels, you know, started boiling to death. 
And then when they reversed the mine, it destroyed the staircase from the lower vein of the mine up to the third vein. So everyone who was still in the third vein at that time was absolutely trapped and had no way to escape. Right. Yeah. A a fireproof mine built with wooden timbers. (laughs) Right. Well, part of what makes your story so fascinating is that you have many different personal accounts, individual stories of bravery, horror, tragedy. And it was really frustrating while reading this, knowing what was about to come and and how casually some of these people were taking the fire. I mean, as you said, 45 minutes between the time the fire started and the time when the miners were finally told to evacuate. Yes, yes. And there was only one sign that pointed toward the exit, and it was written in English, which these immigrants could not read. Uh, 480 men and boys dropped down into that mine that Saturday morning, and 259 of them died in the disaster. Uh, There was one street, Steel Street in Cherry, that was dubbed Widow's Row because only uh, four men from the 37 homes there survived the disaster. And the individual stories are the most touching. I was able to have translated from it, from the Italian before I learned to, to read and speak Italian, uh, diaries of some of the men who were trapped in the mine. And some were written, there were some accounts in English and some accounts in, in Italian. There were notes left by the miners who died. Some of the most touching were there there was a young man named Sam Howard and he was 20 and his younger brother was 15 three years too young to work in the mine but because the people needed a paycheck the mine company looked the other way at the forged proof of of birth you know birth certificates and there were many many underage boys who were working in the mines and so Sam Howard this this all happened three weeks before Thanksgiving. Sam Howard had sent away to the Sears catalog for an engagement ring for his Mamie. And every morning on the way to the mine, he would stop at the post office to see if the ring had arrived. The ring arrived the day of the disaster. And he was planning to propose to, to Mamie that night and to get married at Christmas. And he is one of the young men who did not survive. And he kept writing notes. We're getting weaker um, in, in his group of young men. They took some of the, they had some smaller wooden fans in the mine to circulate the air. And they took any wood that they could find. They took the fan blades, they took any pieces of wood and they, they made their own fan blades. And he was writing a diary and writing a diary. And you can, if you look at the diary, you can see th- that he's losing consciousness, that th- that the words are, are more elongated, that the pen finally slips from his hand. and the last thing he wrote was that the ring is at the post office. Please give it to Mamie. And to me, I mean, that's also reminiscent, you know, of the love story in Titanic, but I mean, that, that what he and his brother did not make it. Their mother was a widow who owned the hotel in town. There were minors. There were 21 or 20. The, the count goes back and forth. There were minors who on the second vein who realized that they were fighting the bad air, that they were that they couldn't breathe. And they thought, well, we'll go deeper into the mine. And the deeper we go, maybe the air will be better and we'll be able to wait out the fire. They'll get the fire out and we'll be able to get out of here. They, so fire happened on a Saturday by, they were still down there by Tuesday. They, and by Tuesday, the, the lamp, the, wax that they used to light their miners lamps on their heads had had been used up so they were now in complete darkness they were eating their belts they were eating the caps the leather caps um brims of their caps they were they had shared what little food they had among themselves in the beginning and now they were thirsty they were looking for pockets of water or something to scrape the walls, to lick the walls for any moisture they could find. And they finally um, 
one of the Scotsmen was very religious and every night he would lead them in singing the Lord's prayer and everybody would follow along in their own, in their own languages. And one night they all sat down and wrote letters that they put in their pockets or notes to their loved ones, you know, goodbye, farewell notes and lay down to die. And in the middle of the night, one of the men woke up and said, I have an idea. Why don't we chop coal from the walls, chop coal from the floor? And why don't we build two walls on either side of ourselves and, and wall ourselves in? And we'll be here in a pocket of good air. We'll wall ourselves in and maybe we'll make it out. And so two guys, two Italian guys went off in search of implements. They found a shovel and a pick. And they, those two and a couple of more worked most of the night to build these, these blockades. And eight days later, those guys, by that time, the, the thirst was killing them. They thought maybe they could, if they broke through, uh, broke through part of the wall and one of them went out on an expedition, that they could find a, uh, a barrel of water left that they had used for the mules or something. And so they broke through the wall and as they were walking, the, the searchers were walking, they, all they saw was fire and thought, oh my God, we're dead. We, we still see fire. But what they saw were the, were the lights of rescuers coming down to rescue them. And, and the miracle of this is that eight days later, after the mine had been sealed over and after all hope was lost, 21 walked out of the mine or were carried out of the mine alive. And then one of them made it home and died in his bed. One of the main antagonists in your story is, is something you mentioned earlier, a black damp, truly frightening. Um, it, it creeps around like something out of a horror movie. Can, can you explain what that is and the effect it had on the miners? Yes. Well, the, the black damp was, was a byproduct of the coal. Um, the, the closest I've come to imagining what it was like in that burning mine is we have neighbors and, and uh, I mean, some businesses whose parking lots and driveways are paved with asphalt. And when you smell that burning asphalt, you know, that hot asphalt, that, that black tar that they're laying down to make a road, that's that's approximates what it, you know what that coal burning smelled like and and there just were pockets of get there were there was white damp which was not as lethal but the black damp was akin to like carbon monoxide poisoning and that was a you know a big a big problem in the mine and um no water no no water no um you know they they would scrape they would scrape the coal and get a little bit of water and immediately throw it up because it was so vile. The miners, so many of the miners in this book, were trying so hard to survive. I mean, the determination, the bravery. They, they prayed. They prayed every single night. I guess that prayer. They, they, they played jokes on each other. They would steal each other's shoes in, the, you know, when they were in the complete darkness there was a little, you know, there were, they had to do something to not lose their minds. But by the eighth day, it was just like, if we don't get out of here and find water one way or another, we're dead. We might as well make an attempt to escape. Ironically, some, I forget about 200 men uh, left the mine at lunchtime. They, they quit the mine that day at lunch hour and they saw the hay cart on fire and later said that it could have easily been put out with their coats, but they assumed that, you know, it was going to be taken care of. And they just, I mean, I don't know how, I don't have any accounts of those people and how they survivors guilt or what, whatever they felt afterward. But that was just another irony and another disaster. And the, um, the nearest mine rescue stations were down in, Southern Illinois and also in Pennsylvania. So when they realized after the, after the fire was sucked out of the mine and actually burnt up the fan, the townspeople were horrified. 
there were about 500 people at the time in Cherry, and there still are. The population has never changed much from 500, 550. But there were more there because we had 160 widows and 500 orphans from that disaster. So the population then was a little bit bigger. But um, the Red Cross came in to aid. The call went out, out to the mine safety bureaus and to the rescue stations, and it took some days for them to get there. And they had helmets that looked like scuba divers. But in the interim, the mine company, after they saw the fan catch fire, they said, we have to smother the fire. So with, with plates of steel and sandbags, they covered over both exits to the mine, both mine shafts, while the townspeople whose family was down there was screaming and crying and clawing and going crazy. And they, some of the women just kept vigil and lay down on the ground and, you know, women weren't working then. This was, this was their, these were their loved ones. And and this was the breadwinner of the family. And they had no idea if they were dead, if they were alive in the beginning, some people did get to escape. One, One of the horror stories of this disaster is that townspeople, the the shop owners, people who had never worked in a mine, when they saw what was going on, they decided that they jumped on the the elevator cage and dropped down to see if they could find anybody and pull anybody out. And some people, they were able to rescue a few people, but these brave people, there were 12 of them, they kept going back. And they had worked out a, sig- a signal with the guy who hoisted the, the, uh, the elevator shaft. And on the seventh trip down, the signals were all crazy. And the people who were in with him in the room, you know, where he building, where he was operating the shaft were saying, pull them up, pull them up. He said, but I don't have the right signal. And I was told I had to wait for the right signal. And finally, you know, they, they just overtook him and said, get, get them up. And they all came up burnt to a crisp. And that was just one of the most hor- horrific scenes uh, of the whole disaster that these heroic people um, lost their lives trying to save save their, their fellow Cherry residents. It was, I can't even imagine what, you know, to have been there and seen that scene. Oh, yeah that engineer you were talking about, um, John Cowley, he was in a difficult position. Yes. He would later explain to a coroner's jury that he thought he was following orders. And he was worried the rope might break. He really thought he was doing the right thing. He thought he was doing the right thing. He thought he was doing the right thing. And, And that poor man. And, 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 People were furious with him. People were furious with the, the coal company for sealing the mine. Uh, the mayor ordered all of the saloons to be closed. I mean, Cherry, Cherry was a, a very small town, and I think there were 18 different saloons. I mean, the, the, so it, this was a horrific job these people were doing, and, uh, you know, the men were paid biweekly, scraping scraping what they could, you know, payday to payday. The mine company owned the school, owned the church, owned the store. Um, Many of the families were so poor, the kids had no shoes and couldn't walk to um, church in November where one of the townsmen had, the the town barber, had uh, set up a, a warm meal for the children and when when hardly any showed up because they were embarrassed or, or because they couldn't walk in the cold with no shoes, he sent for the Red Cross, and Red Cross workers brought shoes to these kids. Yeah. Another thing that you point out, uh, which is really sad, is that the area around the mine was overrun by gawkers, um, curiosity seekers. Oh, yes. Who cleaned up the stores. Yeah. Uh, by Sunday, okay, so so to get to Cherry, Cherry was really the end of the road. Um, the regular train went as far as Ladd, Illinois, which was three miles away. And then there was just a little backup track. 
the, the three miles to Cherry. So you backed up to Cherry from Lad. And by Sunday, so this, this happened on Saturday, Saturday lunchtime. By Sunday, the word had gotten out. And people, I mean, picture this, the 1900s women with their parasols and their big skirts and their big hats and men in their suits. And they all come rushing into Cherry for the spectacle to see what's going on. And on their heels come all, one of the reasons we have so many photos of the disaster and uh, of the aftermath is because the photographers, the postcard photographers came to town and set up. And then f- food vendors came to town and set up. And so you've got this, the, these hysterical suffering people are now a spectacle, you know, for all the curiosity seekers. You've already talked a bit about the chaos above ground, um, the reactions of wives and children to their dead or missing husbands and fathers. Absolutely heartbreaking. For a lot of these women, though, it, it wasn't just their husbands who were working in the mines, right? No, it was a lot of their children. It, my, The cover of the book trap, the, the people on the cover of the book trap include relatives of ours. Um, my grandfather's my grandfather came to Cherry because his aunt lived there with her family. And she had already lost her husband in a mine disaster in Braceville. My grandfather's first cousin, Johnny Galetti, was 18, and he was already the man of a family of six, and he, uh, he worked in the mine. Um, many of the families had, had more than one person in the mine. Johnny Galetti, unfortunately, died in the mine. His brother, Charlie, was the town crier who ran through the, through the streets screaming that the, to alert everybody that the mine was on fire. But the, the rescue attempts, there were several rescue attempts besides the men who died on the cage. Once the professionals arrived on scene, the mine company opened one of the shafts and they lowered down the geological survey guys, lowered down thermometers to test what it was like there. And uh, it's been a while since the Q Creek mine disaster uh, that happened in the United States, but a, a lot of people were riveted to their television sets watching a little yellow capsule go down into the mine to try to rescue those American miners. Well, what the what the mine rescue people had was a whisk, half of a whiskey barrel and rope. And they were, once they decided that they could safely uh, withstand the temperatures in the mine to go look to see if they could find any survivors, two men, each of them one foot in the whiskey barrel and the other, the outer foot out of the whiskey barrel were lowered down into the mine and almost one of them outweighed the other. So the balance was off. And one of the guys was almost tipped over into the, into the mine, into the fire. Um, they, they pulled them, managed to pull them out and they, you know, substituted somebody else who was, you know, more suitable weight wise so that that didn't happen. But there were several attempts to go down and see if they could find anybody. And all they saw were bodies. And so the mine was sealed up again. Um, At that time, you know, there were no close by mine rescue stations. There were no uh, engineers close by. People, you know, with horse and buggy. um, And at that time in this country, you had a life expectancy of 47 years. There were only 10 miles of of paved road in, in Illinois or, you know, people traveled by rail, buggy and steamship. And so, you're talking about primitive conditions and primitive rescue attempts. There were a number of people, as you mentioned earlier, that just insisted on going back down in a desperate attempt to rescue more people. These people would be burned, um, exhausted, yet they'd go down again and again, almost crazy over the fact that their friends, their, their fellow miners, still needed rescuing. Absolutely. Including, uh, one of the, one of the boys, Rosenjack, who had, um, moved the hay cart 
to the side. I mean, the ones who felt responsible for what were going on, what was going on, were the most adamant that they had to go go back in there. It they were like crazed. It's really interesting how the mine company reacted to this. There's a scene in your book where all of the mine executives are coming into town by train, and they're traveling in luxury in their club cars, their, their private dining cars. And all these mining experts are brought in as well. And despite these executives, these specialists, they really had a hard time making decisions. There was a lot of debate, slow debate, on how to deal with the fire, whether to turn on the fan and blow air in or reverse the fan and, and take the air out. I mean... It was hard for them to make decisions. In the beginning, they didn't have the experts there. And even the experts um, weren't exactly sure, you know, exactly what to do. Um, it, it was a guessing game. They would listen for noises to see if they, if, at one point, they thought that there was enough oxygen for the men and that um, they listened, you know, to hear up top, they listened to see if there were any noises coming uh, from down below, it, it, some farmers heard detonations and tappings and, and gunshots like about a mile away that they thought was coming from inside the mine. But basically, it, it was too smoky to see and too hot to endure. And so um, all, all those rescue attempts were really, you know, these people were putting their lives at risk. And Rosenjack was one of the ones who felt responsible for the fire. And he was a mystery for a long time. Everybody, you know, th there were a few people who skedaddled out of town. And last I heard from Jack Rooney, there were still some genealogists trying to figure out if they went back to Scotland, um, if, if there was maybe some, some kind of a conspiracy theory going on regarding the fire. And these guys got out of town. But Rose and Jack, nobody knew what happened to Rose and Jack. And being a genealogist, I started doing some exploration. And for his um, penance, should we say, the man ended up, I, I ended up finding out that he lived a couple of hours away from me in Michigan in Grand Rapids, and that his reparation for what had happened was that he became a fireman. Wow. Wow. When they pulled him out the last time, and he was severely burned, he still insisted on going back in. And the way you described how he looked, um, I was guessing at that point that he would not make it. Yep, yep, yep. One, The eight-day men, they call them the eight-day men, kept diaries. And one of them, Antonori Corderoli, um, with whose family I've become friends, uh, I had his, that it was his diary that I had translated and he kissed his wife goodbye. And, and I think the baby, baby was 18 months old. It was a young, a young little boy that they had he kissed him goodbye in the morning. And when he wrote his goodbye letter and put it in his pocket, he was one of the 21 who thought they were going to die. He said, when, when my son grows up, tell him his father was a good man. And back in the day when I was on book tour, when the book came out, I was at the Borders in Chicago, which is no longer there. And I, in telling the story, I said, and he said, please tell my son that his father was a good man. And a man in the front row said, that son was my dad. And I just got my, all the hair stood up on my head. And, um, Every year in Cherry, they remember the disaster. They, there is a pancake breakfast and a mass. And uh, for the 100th anniversary uh, memorial of the disaster, the mayor figured, oh, maybe 200 people would show up in Cherry for it. But there's a Facebook group, the 1909 Cherry Mine Disaster. There is a museum in Cherry. Uh, many of the descendants of both those who died and those who survived have you have just a staggering interest in the story. And 2,000 people showed up that day for the um, 100th anniversary. But I wish that Cherry wasn't such an isolated place 
And I wish that, you know, the, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire happened. It's a similar disaster that happened a couple of years after Cherry. But because that happened, that fire killing, you know, immigrant workers happened in New York. And you've got many city universities and universities and, you know, still a large Italian population. There were Italian and Jewish seamstresses who died in that. So it's taught in, in the schools. It's taught in the colleges. Um, every year they do something. They make, they make a quilt. They draw the names of those people on the sidewalks. I, I just wish we had enough interest and enough knowledge. You know, people had enough knowledge about this. The disaster is still stands as the United States' worst coal mine fire for loss of life, third worst coal mine disaster of any kind. And the historical significance is unbelievable. Uh, on the heels of the Cherry Mine disaster, uh, child labor laws were changed. Mine safety laws were changed. The first mine safety rescue stations were built where, you know, kind of like, like your fire department, but it was for mines. And they started building them closer to where mines were throughout the United States. Um, the following year, the Bureau of Mines was created uh, there had been talk about it with President Taft uh, up about until that time, but I think the Cherry Mine disaster was the straw that broke the camel's back, and finally the, the Bureau of Mines was created. And it was the first, the settlement with the mine company was the first application of workers' comp ever in this country. The workers' comp law had been passed in Great Britain a year or two before, and in trying to make a settlement uh, with the widows and with the orphans, the attorneys for the families relied on, uh, pushed for, and relied on uh, following the model of the workers' comp. I had the opportunity to read not only the 700-page and make a copy of the 700-page coroner's inquest, uh, with the testimony of everyone who was involved in the disaster. But I also, I went to Cherry. I did a lot of on-site research in Cherry and in Princeton and read newspaper accounts and copies of the letters that went back and forth between the mine owners who were sitting in their nice railroad cars drinking whiskey and having nice meals while all of this, trying to figure out what to do while all all of this was going on. The letters, well, with the language of the day, the use of the English language at that time, um, which we would find stilted now, but the letters back and forth between the mine company and the lawyers, I found extremely fascinating. And I had included them in the book. And my editor at Atria said, okay, um, you got to cut out a third of what you've written and it's your choice where to cut it. But I would stop it, you know, like before we get into all of the back and forth with, with the settlement. And I keep thinking, I still have that chunk of book that I might put it up um, so that people can, can see what was going on between management and worker at the time. It was very fascinating. Were, Were they reluctant to give compensation to the families? Oh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. They were reluctant. I mean, the, the amount that these, that, that these people got, my, the, the other, the family story was um, Johnny Galetti's mother, my, what would she be? My great, great aunt. My, my grandfather's aunt is probably my great, great aunt. I mean, she told them that they could keep their money. Uh, she refused. She was taken to court on contempt of court charges um, because she wouldn't accept the settlement that was paid out. Uh, the fine that the mine company, they were fined like about $180 for each child who was illegally working in the mine, which was nothing. Johnny Galetti's uh, siblings were each given $180 in payment, and his mother was given, th- my, my great-great-aunt was, was given $360 in, in uh, recompense for his life. Huh. Wow. So what was your grandfather's story? Do you know much about what he experienced 
that day? Well, I'll tell you, I did. I, I had just about finished writing the book, Eric. And by that time, my father was dead. Uh, I got a lot of information from my dad's cousin, Lester Corsini, whose um, father and uh, uncles are on the cover of the book. And by that, by that time, uh, Lester didn't live to see the book come out either. But my mother finally said to me, well, you know why Grandpa Tintori wasn't in the mine that day? I'm like, what? Or why he survived, why he survived the disaster. I'm like, what? You've known this the whole time I'm working on this book? and What? And she said, oh, yeah, he had a hangover and he didn't go to work that day. Wow. You know, the the 18 saloons that they had? Well, I found out later, I kept looking for my grandfather's records. So the Cherry Mine disaster um, happened November 13th of 1909. My grandfather hit Ellis Island on October 3rd, 1909. So you figure by the time he was processed at Ellis Island and took a train from New York to Cherry, Illinois, he was like the new kid on the block. And um, what a welcome to the United States to have something this horrific happen and, and kill, his, kill his first cousin. Well, this happened on a Saturday. I'm sure there were a lot of men out drinking that Friday night. Pro- probably, probably. I mean, the, the, uh, the judge, I can tell you what the judge said regarding uh, my great, great aunt. I have, I have your letter in which you say your mother does not wish to sign her receipt. I'm sorry she's so foolish as she is just losing the use of her money. If, do- if your mother does not make up her mind to sign soon, then I must take some other means to close up the estate. She was fined three dollars and five cents, which he deducted from her three hundred and sixty dollars for contempt of court. So eventually, uh, they had to seal the mine again because the fire kept burning, and I mean, the tents, morgue tents were set up. It was just a very chilling, a chilling scene um, as the bodies were being brought out. Then people had to come and identify their loved ones. Some only were able to be identified by a button that was on their clothes. Um, 20,000 people, 20,000 people ended up showing up to, you know, to watch what was going on. And um, even into, into Thanksgiving day. And it was not until I'm probably the following February that the last bodies were pulled out of the mine and the mine was sealed up for good. Did mining continue in in that area? Not with the St. Paul Coal Company. Um, Some independents bought the mine and they would mine it um, kind of on an as-need basis. Someone would say, I need X amount of coal for the winter and they'd go down, you know, it was, it was, it became a private local uh, business and probably for about 10 more years. And then, and then that was it. Then that family gave up mining also. Wow. Yeah. I have to say your, your book, I know, I know you're a novelist, a fiction writer, but this book reads like a novel, which is a compliment Thank you. It is a compliment. My background is actually, my training is actually as a journalist. I have a degree in journalism, advertising, and PR. And I worked, you know, as, as a nonfiction writer. And the first book that I did with, a, with my former writing partner and another author was nonfiction. Well, she wanted to do uh, a novel about four women all getting married, all with secrets that could put the kibosh on the wedding plans. And I said, I, I, I don't write fiction. And she said, a writer can write anything. And so we wrote that together and it ended up becoming a, a, a CBS TV movie and excerpted it in Cosmo. So what, what um, the, the genre of both uh, the 1909 Nut Trap, the 1909 Cherry Mine Disaster, and Unto the Daughters is narrative nonfiction. And I say that I use my journalist's head and my novelist's heart to, to set the scene. In Trapped, there is only one 
sentence, one scene that I made up, and that was the breakfast scene. I imagined what the breakfast scene was like at the beginning. Everything else is taken from primary documents, but I wrote it in a way that would be novelistic. And the first person who was credited with inventing this genre is Truman Capote, who wrote In Cold Blood. And then we have Eric Larson now. Um, I read uh, Isaac Storm, the, the story of the hurricane that destroyed half of Galveston before I wrote this, just to get, you know, read, I read In Cold Blood and I read that just to get a feel for the genre. And I'm, I'm a big fan of Eric Larson's work. Can I ask you um, your other nonfiction true crime book, Unto the Daughters, The Legacy of an Honor Killing in an Italian-American Family? Can you give us a synopsis of that book? Oh, well, the synopsis of that book, what happened was um, while I was doing all of this research on my grandfather, my mother said to me, oh, you don't have to uh, do much on my side of the family because grandma's got all the papers. And I did not realize that I was being stalled for years and years and years. It was like, oh yeah, you can come over Tuesday and see the papers. And on Monday night, I get a call saying, oh, we forgot grandma has a doctor's appointment tomorrow. And this went on for, I don't know how many years. And I never picked up that they were hiding something. And that is the story. I I thought I knew my Sicilian side of the family inside and out. My grandmother, there were three brothers, three sisters, and three brothers that there were nine kids and a very close-knit family. Uh, There were actually three brothers, four sisters, and three brothers. And the sister next after my grandmother um, was murdered by her brothers, the two oldest brothers, in an honor killing in Detroit. Uh, She's not on the 1920 census. So just as women were getting the vote, um, she'd been in this country six years. They emigrated in 1914 from Sicily, Um, just as every, her whole life was ahead of her, et cetera. They murdered her because she eloped with the young barber she was in love with instead of marrying the quote mafioso my great grandfather had promised her to who was 20 years her senior and mafioso in 1920 in detroit was rum running stealing tires uh stealing cars um there were a bunch of street gangs the the guys from corleone and the guys from uh terracini and you know it was it was a nascent mafia here it wasn't any it was just like a bunch of a bunch of hoodlums doing that kind of stuff, but because their sister ruined her, their, her, their chances in getting in with a better gang, she had to pay. And it took me 12 years to uncover that story. And I took the thread and everybody had a different story about why, what, and I followed the common thread. And that's what I wrote it three entire times as fiction. Because, you know, with the Sicilians, there's this omerta. You, you don't air your dirty laundry. You don't talk about this stuff. Keep quiet. And when I told my mother if this story was true, I mean, she screamed at me, your father went to his grave and he never knew that blankety blank, blank, blank. And knowing that I was a writer, she said, forget it. Forget you ever heard it. But by, by the end, she would say, I, I thought of another story you could add to your book. Um, <laughs> but that story, when my mom was dying of pancreatic cancer, um, one of the youngest brothers came to town. And um, he was my mother's age because my mother and her, my mother, my grandmother and my great grandmother were pregnant at the same time. So my mom's uncles were her age, her last three uncles were her age. Um, and I, he said, if no, his daughter said, if no one is in the kitchen, no strangers are in the kitchen, meaning my husband or my sister's husband, he'll tell you the story. And he told me, he was, he was like six or eight years old when it happened. He told me what I had deduced. And so I thought, okay, that's, I'm going with it. And then my Atria editor of Trap said to me, you, you know, you've written this book three whole times as a novel. It, it's not selling. Each time the protagonist was a different age. She said, you have to give yourself permission to reimagine her life and write that story. And so that, I, then I did, you know, researched 
how does this happen in an Italian Catholic family? What was going on in Sicily at the time? And spent 12 years researching till finally I was, I was happy with that book. And it's the book on my heart. Well, that sounds great. Very interesting. And you have a website, correct? KarenTentori.com. Perfect. And you can find me on Facebook, KarenTentori.com. On the, uh, it's Karen Tentori on all social media, put it that way. Well, this has been wonderful. Thank you for taking some time to share the story with us. I really appreciate the invitation, Eric, and your interest in this story and and your help in getting it out to more people because, you know, it, it, not only is it a tragedy, but it was a historically significant one that, that very few people know about. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Yes, yes. Again, I have been speaking to Karen Tintori. Her book is called Trapped, the 1909 Cherry Mine Disaster. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow.